Hey guys, how are you doing this morning? <laughs> we are Cape Cod African Dance and Drum, and we are so honored to be here at Connecting for Change Conference this morning with all of you who are doing so much for our planet. We want to celebrate and honor all of you guys, especially you young folks who are beginning to think this way, beginning to work for the planet. We are so happy and so honored that all of you are thinking and working towards changing our world. And actually, whenever I come to this conference, it gives me truly, it really gives me hope for the world. So keep on, keep it on, you guys, and don't stop and don't ever get discouraged. You guys are our leaders. You are the future. We offer our African dance and drumming today to our Mother Earth. We honor our Mother Earth. We love her. She gives us everything. We offer all of our love and our joy to our Mother Earth. The traditions that we're going to share today are from the Malinke people of Mali and Guinea, West Africa. And these rhythms and dances are so full of celebration. They're so full of life. We want you guys to feel that today for real. Feel it in your bodies. Clap whenever you want to. Shout whenever you want to. Feel the celebration, the ancient celebration of life that is these ancient Malinke rhythms. And we are blessed very blessed today to have a master drummer with us from Mali, West Africa. Let me introduce Isa Kulibali. Get a load of that, you guys. Issa, show them a little bit more of what you got there. Lay some more rhythm on us. You just get the chills when you listen.
what it means it goes something like this hey drummers hey drummers come on get that rhythm going for me drummers get that rhythm going for me so I can feel happiness so I can feel that happiness in my soul come on come on Isa. what you got Drummers, let's get 
<laughs> so, <laughs> you guys are a great audience. Great dancing out there, you guys. Great spirit. It's fun to dance with you. So how many of you guys would like to come up and try playing these djembes? Come on up, you guys. We've got about 10 people going. You two, you, you, you. Yes. Girls and boys, you, you guys, you guys, come on. Okay. We got some young folks. We want the professors out there too. Come on, professors. Come on up. Speakers. Yes. We need all generations. <laughs> One of our drum leaders, Sam Homestock, of the band N Train, will lead this little drum demo. Let's have a big hand for Sam Homestock. So you guys out there can clap, you can drum on your thighs, drum on your chairs, drum on the ground. You actually don't even need a drum, just beat out the rhythm somehow. Feel the pulse in your heart. You guys can follow along with Sam. for these awesome drummers. Good. So why don't you go 
guys go back to your seats. We'll get another group of 10 folks to come up and try the drumming. And we're going to dance, too, at the same time. So those of you who want to try out some moves, and I'll go real easy on you guys. Don't worry. We'll do some real easy steps. Come on up. Enjoy the African steps. And we'll get a new group of drummers. Those of you who really want to drum, please come up and grab a drum. Good job, you guys. Awesome. Very good. If you want to stay and dance, you can. Yeah, please. Oh, you're welcome. Come on up, you guys. Don't be shy. Let's get, let's get that rhythm going. We'll do Gende. And Sam, you can just guide them. Yep. Let's form a big circle up here on the stage and dance for all of your friends and colleagues.
so much for coming up. Thank you so much for coming up and dancing with us, you guys. Beautiful dancing, beautiful drumming. Keep up your wonderful work, everyone. We have so much hope for you, so much respect for what you're doing. Have a wonderful rest of your conference. Um, and if you're interested in our group, check out our website, Cape Cod African Dance and Drum. Dot com. We teach African dance and drumming throughout Cape Cod and the New England area. We give lots of performances. So please come check us out. We'd love to keep dancing and drumming with you and keep that spirit going. You guys, have a beautiful day. I think we, I think we can do better than that. Let's give them another big hand for Cape Cod African dance and drum. Good morning. If you're not awake after that, there's a problem. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome to the final day of the ninth annual Connecting for Change conference. I'm Callum Grieve. I'm a board member of the Marion Institute, a nonprofit organization that seeks root cause solutions to some of our most pressing social and environmental challenges. And Connecting for Change, for any of you who are just joining us this morning, is our annual gathering of social and environmental innovators who are forwarding visionary yet practical models for deep and positive change. Now, Connecting for Change is, is one of our programs, and while the Marion Institute is the organization at the heart of this conference, there is an ecosystem of organizations who offer us generous support and help to make this happen. So, I want to thank these organizations now. They are UMass Dartmouth, the Center at Westwoods, the Southeastern Environmental Education Alliance, Chelsea Green Publishing, Rainforest Maker, Arjuna Capital and Baldwin Brothers, and of course, Bioneers. Let's give them a huge hand. So we have a phenomenal list of speakers this morning. So if it's okay with you, I'm just going to dive right in. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Swanee Hunt's mission is to achieve gender parity, especially as a means to end war and rebuild societies, as well as to alleviate poverty and other human suffering. At Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, Swanee is the Eleanor Roosevelt Lecturer in Public Policy. In 1997, she founded the Women in Public Policy Program, a research center concerned with domestic and foreign policy, which she directed for more than a decade. She teaches inclusive security, exploring how women are systematically excluded from peace processes and the impact and policy steps needed to rectify the problem. At the Kennedy School, she is also core faculty at the Center for Public Leadership and a senior advisor to the Initiative to Stop Human Trafficking at the Carr Center for Human Rights. Swanee has taught the choreography of social movements at Harvard College and peace building from the ground up at Harvard Law School and she's lectured across the university campus, including at the college, the School of Education, the Divinity School, and the Business School. Swanee's photographs have exhibited in more than a dozen one-woman shows in five countries. Her musical composition, The Witness Cantata for Five Soloists and Chorus, has had 12 performances in six cities. Her world includes three children, three grandchildren, a cat, a parrot, eight horses, and 76 bison. Please welcome to Connecting for Change, Swanee Hunt. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. 
Oh, I sound so academic, don't I, in that introduction. And he cheated, because normally I say my world includes my children, my, uh, my parrot, my cat, my horses, my bison, and my grandchildren. That seems to me the best order. Hey, you all, how many of you were up here on stage? Congratulations, congratulations. Could I see your hands again? Okay, good. Could we please give them applause? Oh, yeah. The reason I won't applaud you is that you understand so well this fabulous quote from Alice in Wonderland. How many of you have read the book, right? Most of you, okay? But you know the story, right? So Alice is, has fallen through the looking glass, and she's in Wonderland, and she's having all of these adventures. And she comes across the queen. And um, is it the queen of hearts? I think it's the queen of hearts. You know, this big chess game and all this. And so she says, uh, she says, it's no use trying... One can't believe impossible things. And then the queen answers her. Oh, well, clearly you haven't had much practice. Um, why, sometimes I believe six impossible things before breakfast. And it seems to me that those of you who came up on stage, if we'd asked you this morning, if you were gonna be up here doing African drumming and African dancing, you would have said, not today, thank you, you know? And it would have felt completely impossible to you. So I don't know what it was you had for breakfast, you know? So, um, but it was enough to get you up here on stage. And that's what this morning is about. That's what this whole conference is about, how we inspire each other to do the impossible things. And by the way, what is impossible? All impossible is is what somebody thinks. It's just, it's just a construct in your mind, right? Like people say, well, that's beyond, that's beyond the barrier. Well, well, who set the barrier? Now, there used to be all kinds of impossible things that are now not considered impossible at all. We thought it was impossible to have a woman as the Secretary of State. Well, guess what? Yeah. Guess what? John Kerry, our senator, is the first white guy to be Secretary of State in 20 years. It's been all women and an African-American man. And that, I'll tell you, because I was in foreign policy uh, at the time, and when Madeleine Albright, you know, I mean, President Clinton said to me, what do you think, what do you think? I could appoint this white guy or uh, I could have you know, Madeleine Albright. I said, hands down, Madeleine Albright, you know? And, and it wasn't because I thought she was better on foreign policy. I just thought, we gotta break this ceiling. We've just got to. And I'll tell you why I thought that. You know, every one of you has your life experiences that you, that you relate to, and you have a spine of life experiences, and, and they really create who you are. And they, they, they determine how you walk in the world. Well. I have two life experiences that were that important to me. One was when I was 29. How many of you are under 29? Aha! And shall I ask how many are over? I don't have to. Okay. <laughs> you see, I go to Harvard. I can figure this out. Okay. So you have this kind of experience ahead of you. So. Here I am in Dallas, Texas. Those of you who are over 50 understand that Dallas, Texas in the 70s has a certain meaning. Very, very conservative. Not just politically, but just in, in the way the world works. So, uh, I am an owner of an oil and gas company. And the vice president of the company says, or I say to him, hey, Tom, we should have lunch. He says, Swanee, let me know next time you'll be in town because I'm living in Denver. So I do, and he says, great. And he said, I'll make a reservation. I said, you don't need to. I'll make the reservation. Oh, no, Swanee. No, Tom, I'll do it. So day comes, and I say the reservation is in the Petroleum Club. Now, the Petroleum Club is a place that 
uh, heads of petroleum, you know, oil and gas companies go, and they make their deals. It's kind of like, kind of like politicians on the golf course or students stu sitting around in the student lounge. That's where m the most important transactions happen, not in the classroom. Okay, so uh, we go up the elevator. It's a real bit tall building, and we go up the elevator. Door is open. And there is a tall African-American man in a red coat. And he says, hello, good day. I have a beautiful table for you over here by the window in the ladies' dining room. <laughs> the, the laugh came from people over 50. <laughs> because it used to be that any kind of institution, a professional institution like this, almost any kind, was segregated. Not the way you think. It was even segregated in terms of where women could go and where men could go. For example, the U.S. Senate didn't have a women's bathroom during this time because they didn't expect women to be in the Senate. That gives you some kind of sense of the culture. Okay, so we're up there, and I say, oh, no, uh, thank you, I reserved a table um, in the main dining room. Well, if you have a name like Swanee, nobody can tell if you're a man or a woman, right? It's one of the few advantages. So Tom's getting nervous, and he said, and, and the maitre d' says, but I have a beautiful table over here, and... Um, it, it's in a corner, it's private, etc. I said, no, thank you. Uh, I have a reservation in the main dining room. And, oh, in fact, I see the name Hunt over there on the table. That's our table. Tom at this point says, okay, Solani, I get it. Okay, let's go. I said, no, Tom, I have a table in the main dining room. Those of you over 50 remember that we were doing training in this. We actually were. We would train so that we would say the same thing over and over. We would stay calm. It was kind of like what's happening, you know, uh, with Martin Luther King, with training in the church basements to, to be, you know, nonviolent resistance. You just say the same thing over and over. You sit down um, in the... Walgreens uh, at the bar of the restaurant, and you just sit there and wait for someone, you know, if you're African American, and you wait for people to not serve you, that kind of thing. Okay, so same thing. So I say, uh, no, our table's over there. Tom is saying, let's go, please, Swanee, please. And I say, no, our table's there. And the maitre d', this powerful, tall black man says to me, uh, Ma'am, I can, I can take you to that table. It will cost me my job. And that was an amazing moment for me because I realized that I had more in common with this tall black man standing there in front of me than I did with Tom. That was an amazing moment. Uh, Dallas was completely segregated. I did not know any black people. Any, there was like 25% black. I did not know one black person who didn't work in our yard or clean our house. Now, that may seem impossible for you to, to understand, but that was just how it was. And I can't explain it to you except to say the churches were segregated, the restaurants were segregated. You, even the State Fair of Texas had color day. Right? Even the water fountains said white and colored. So I didn't know any. And yet I realized the person I had something in common with was he. Because he couldn't eat in that restaurant either. Okay. Can anyone relate to that? I mean, in your own lives today? Well, let me tell you what you might relate to. Is that when he said that to me, and Tom said, could we please go? I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a next step. So we got back in the elevator, and we went down, and we got a sandwich somewhere. So I consider that an attempt story that ended in a failure. Now, maybe Tom learned a little something. Maybe, I don't know what else, but maybe the story traveled and 
you know, a hundred years later, they decided to let women in. I don't know. But it never felt like a great experience to me. Can anyone at least relate to that? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And that crosses ages. All right, so now I want you to fast forward 17 years. Now I have become this real big deal. I have become the U.S. ambassador to Austria, and that means I'm full-time overseeing an embassy in Vienna with 500 employees. We're working in 21 countries actually from there. We have the largest intelligence operation in the world because we've been spying on countries, you know, all across the Soviet Union, et cetera. The Soviet Union has fallen apart. It's a time of tremendous turmoil. Countries don't know which way they're going. Are they going to stay communist? Or are they going to follow the West? It's just a mess. And there's this secure place called Vienna that juts out into Eastern Europe, even though it's part of Western Europe. Okay. So to our south is this large country, Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia has come to be headed up by a tyrant who is later indicted as a war criminal. Well, all the states are breaking up uh, inside Yugoslavia. One of them is called Bosnia. The conflict is so awful inside of Bosnia that 150,000 people have been killed. It is like Syria, which you've been following on the news, except it's a country of about four million people. And Syria, I should know, but let's say it's 30 million, okay, or 40 million. So this is a, a really small country. So this is like, this is like um, Eastern Mass, 150,000 people killed. Can you, can you get that? And that's killed. That's not people dying of heart attacks or people dying of cancer. I mean, they're killed, they're shot, they're blown up. It's like the, you know what, it's like the, the marathon bombing, but it's happening every day for three and a half years, and people are living in their basements. They're cowering in there. Okay, so what's happening mostly is that there's a group called the Serbs, and they are wanting to take over, and they're trying to push out a third of the population who are the Muslims. All right, can you get that? A third of the population is trying to be killed, raped, mutilated. This is in Europe, right? So, uh, I mean, it, it's just inconceivable. The U.S. doesn't want to intervene. They think, oh, we're going to get in there. We won't be able to get out. The same, most of the European countries are saying the same thing. I'm pushing for intervention. I'm right there. I'm hearing the stories. So, finally, finally, there's this massacre. And sometimes change happens only when there's a god-awful something happened. So there's this massacre, and 8,000 boys and men are rounded up. They are unarmed, and they're all executed and thrown into mass graves. The women, the mothers, and the children, and the very old people, they've been put on buses. They've been told, oh, the boys are going to come. And the young men are going to come, and, and the women wait, and they wait, and they wait a hundred miles away, and they never see the men in their life again. And the, your, the international community, meaning all, all the countries like ours and the United Nations, feel so ashamed of what they've allowed to happen that they just want to forget it. So I'm working with these women. First of all, that triggers our intervention. We do intervene. We stop the war, et cetera, something we could have done two years earlier. Okay, so I'm in this role of this diplomat. I'm seen as the hope because I get it, et cetera, but I don't have enough power to do what I want to do. So these women come to me and they say, we've been completely forgotten. We're leave, living in burned out houses. Can you do anything to remind the world? And so we pull together 6,000 of them. And we're, we're going to have a stadium like this, except huge sports stadium. And the women are going to embroider the names of their missing boys and men on different colored cloths. And we're going to hang them all over. If you can imagine, all these brightly colored 
pieces of fabric. And so I'm talking with one of the women right before, and she is saying to me, I lost my husband, I lost my two brothers, I had three boys, and I know the others may be dead. I've heard the stories, but, but my youngest son, he was the fastest in his class. He was the fastest runner in his class. And I know that he was able to run into the woods. I know it, and he's in the woods right now, and he doesn't know the war, the war is over. And I have to say to her what I had been told by a general. For this gathering, where you have Queen Noor from Jordan flying in and all these other officials from the UN, we will not provide you security. And security is key in case there's a Serb attack. We will not serve, uh, provide you security unless you invite and have the mothers of the men who committed the massacre. Because we want to be fair. So I'm saying to this woman who is shaking like this, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, my heart is with you. I'm crying, okay? I say, uh, I have to ask you though, uh, when we have this gathering, we'll, uh, um, we, uh, we, we can't have security provided, meaning soldiers, to protect us unless we invite the mothers of the Serbs who just killed the five men and boys in your life. And I'm thinking, oh, what do I know about trauma? What do I know about the psychology? What do I know about the wounds of war? How on earth could I say this to her? How on earth? I mean, it's like ripping her open. And she looked at me and she said, Ambassador Hunt, we're all mothers. That was the moment for me. That was the life-changing moment. It wasn't my courage. It was being with her. And since then, I've worked in 40 conflict areas. And I've heard these stories every day, whether whether it's Congo or Colombia or Korea, I have heard these stories every day. Guys, please don't feel like I'm saying anything negative about you, truly, truly. Your role in supporting women and girls is so important. But can you imagine if she had said to me, you know, it's impossible, Ambassador Hunt. It's impossible to do that. There's no use trying. These women don't stare at the maitre d' and the vice president of the company next to them and say, well, let's go get a sandwich. They don't do that. They're much more courageous than I will ever be, much more. But I, I have taken those experiences and I've put them into an impossible situation that I feel good about that relates so directly to you. It's about stopping prostitution. People call it sex trafficking. I don't know why that makes them feel better. It's really prostitution. And guess what? You have a choice about how you're going to attack this. An FBI agent told me that he was talking to a pimp and he was interviewing him. How do you find your women? and your girls, because the average age in which a female starts on the street is 15, 15, one, five. Okay, so he says, I go to a mall and I look around and I find a girl walking by herself. Okay, those of you, women and girls, you understand that that, that has meaning, a girl walking by herself. Guys, we don't go to malls and walk around by ourselves. That is a social event. We do it with another girl, okay? 
So I, I go and I find a girl walking by herself. And I say to her, hey, you have beautiful eyes. And if she looks me back in the face and says, thank you, then I just keep going. And then I look for the next girl walking by herself, and I say, hey, you've got beautiful eyes. And if she looks down at her shoes and says, no, I don't, he said, I know I've got her. So are we going to be able to stop having girls walk in the mall and look at their shoes and say, no, I don't? I want to. I hope to. That's the supply for the prostitution. She gets picked up in about 48 hours from the time she has run away from home. So we can try to staunch the supply, and there are a lot of great groups doing that. We can try to, to stop the pimps. That's the distribution system. Supply, distribution. What does that leave in economic theory? Supply and demand. Thank you. And we can say, no, actually, we're going to stop the demand. Say what? You know, the demand, the buyers. What? I mean, boys, you know, boys will be boys. You know how many men and boys say that they have purchased? About 15% have purchased the body of a woman or a girl, 15%. Do you know what that translates to in the United States? It's about 15 million. This is not, I mean, look, I don't, I know a, lo a number of survivors, the women and the girls, and I probably know some pimps, but I'm not aware of it. I know hundreds of Johns. And in fact, a few of them, a very few, have told me, but you know, they're at my dinner table, they're in my classroom, they're at church. Yeah, they're in this auditorium. These are, not, these are not just bad guys, okay? Average, white, middle class, lives in the suburbs and has children. The girl, average, impoverished, black, brown, much, much younger than the guy. Okay, so this is a social justice issue. And when you say we can't address it, what are you saying? What are you saying? You know that something that is this egregious, we can't stop? Well, we used to say that about domestic violence. I, some of you over 50, we worked on setting up shelters for battered women. Y'all remember those? And finally, some of us said, how come they are leaving their homes with their children? What is this about? The guys stay in the home, and the women who are beating up, being beaten up have to leave, and we got some laws changed. And you know what? It still happens. Guys still beat up their partners, but it's against the law, and they're considered like, something's wrong with you, guy. And that's what we're going to do. It's good for the guys to change. It's good for society to change. It's absolutely necessary for the women and girls. Yeah. So, I thank you. I hear the energy. I hear the belief. And so that's what I want to close with. You know, what do we do about that feeling like, well, you know, th this isn't really something I can at attack or, or, you know, I, I guess if I were in that mall, I don't know what I would say if someone came up to said that to me. Probably I'd say, well, no, I don't. Or I don't know if every boy and man in my life had been killed. I, I don't know how I would react or, or gosh, I can, I can really relate to Swanee at the, you know, at the top of that elevator. What's she supposed to do? Well, one of the things I've learned is the art of pretending. So let me close this out and sing a song that those of you over 50 know. I'll just sing a little snippet of it. It's from The King and I. And you're welcome to sing along. Whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune, and no one will suspect I'm afraid. While shivering in my shoes, I strike a careless pose and whistle a happy tune so no one ever knows I'm afraid. Now, this is the best line. Are you ready? Okay. The result of this deception is very strange to tell. Sing it with me. Because when I fool the people I fear, 
I fool myself as well. Okay? So that's the answer. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, when you get up in the morning and you think, what am I going to do today? Well, got to be careful. I, you know, I think I can accomplish this. I think I think I can do that. I mean, come on. Come on. My challenge to you is by tomorrow's breakfast, you think of six impossible things. Six that you're going to do by breakfast. Six impossible things, and I'm going to give you all day today to choose them. Okay, thank you all so much for letting me have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yay. Be strong. Yes. Go for the impossible. Six impossible things. Are you working on that already? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, um, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to a very special band called Our Lady of Guadalupe Choir. Come on, guys. Good morning. We are a group from Guadalupe Church. Pertenecemos a la iglesia de Guadalupe, County Street. Esta es nuestra primera canción. Cristo Libertador is with first song. Cristo nos da la esperanza. 
Cristo nos ha el amor, el amor, el amor, el amor. Thank you. Our next song is called Un Mandiamento. Señor, 
que nos amemos todos como nos ama Dios. Gracias. Thank you. This is the last song. The name is uh, Tu Palabra Me Da Vida. Uh, the world made me alive. Gracias. God bless you. Asa Needle is a member of the staff collective of the Worcester Roots Project, a nonprofit that brings together youth and adult organizers to create opportunities for economic social, and environmental justice. ASA works with democratic, worker-controlled cooperatives, such as the youth-run Toxic Soil Busters, as a model for a new economics of liberation that is autonomous, inclusive, and just. ASA works with numerous community outreach and advocacy organizations, including the Solidarity and Green Economy Alliance, the Cooperative Power, and the Stone Soup Community Center. ASA was one of the 2012 winners of the National Brower Youth Award for Outstanding Youth Leadership. And he's here with us this morning. Please give a big Connecting for Change welcome to Asa Needle. Who's 
already felt inspired today at this conference? Anybody? Hi everyone, my name is Asa Needle. I'm here from the Worcester Roots Project and I'm here to talk to you about some of the social and economic revolutions that are happening in my hometown, the town I love called Worcester, Massachusetts. I grew up in this city. It's a city of about 180,000 people. And it's a city that most people outside of Massachusetts haven't even heard of. And when people do know about Worcester, when they look at Worcester, often all they can see is just another post-industrial town where the heavy industry is left, leaving behind unemployment, vacant lots, and abandoned buildings. But when I look at Worcester, I see a city ready to be on the cutting edge of a new way of doing business. And I'm not talking about some future fantasy eco-city. I'm talking about the solutions from urban gardens to worker cooperatives, from collective land ownership to direct action for environmental justice that we are building now, not tomorrow, today. Our Worcester Roots Project started in 2001 when residents in the Maine South and Piedmont neighborhoods came together to take a stand against these environmental injustices, specifically the lead-contaminated soil that disproportionately affected the lower-income neighborhoods. It was that frustration around these deep disparities and the way children especially were being poisoned in our neighborhoods that motivated them to start offering free lead soil testing and low cost soil remediation methods and experimenting with new ones like phytoremediation, using plants to soak up the lead in the soil, using the nature's own processes to heal itself and heal our, heal our communities. It was also one of the founding groups that rented space at the Stone Soup Community Center. So Worcester Roots Project isn't just about creating these changes in our environment with the community. They're also about broadcasting those stories and giving residents, youth, workers, people in the community that are most affected by these environmental injustices, people that are on the front lines of these battles for a better world and a cleaner future that can broadcast those stories so that they can be heard all around the world. And this is we're, some of our projects here. Community-based research and social justice youth development are two of the cornerstones of the Worcester Roots Project's work. And our collaborations, including Co-op Power and many others that represent our family of organizations that we see as dedicated to building whole systems and economies that are based around new principles, not principles of competition, not principles of profit over people in the environment, but principles that place our needs, the needs of the people that live in these communities first and not second. No, I didn't always see my city this way. I don't think a lot of people come to Worcester to hit it big or make a name for themselves. They come for work or for family or because they want to find some better life for their children. And growing up in Worcester, um, I was on the top floor of a triple-decker apartment and we had immigrant neighbors from Africa on the second floor and Brazilians on the first floor. And my first experiences, my first memories of the city are probably of being out on that back patio and all those people from all around the world, from all these different backgrounds, communicating and talking. And my dad was always the kind of person that would embarrass you by going up and talking to strangers. Does anybody know someone like that? Someone that always goes up and talks to that people. And my mother was a weaver, so she would like connect people using arts. She would bring out these looms and people from all these different ethnic backgrounds who sometimes couldn't even speak the same language would connect over this shared love of color, a shared love of creating something. And it sounds simple, but those, like, simp those small building blocks of what community means, going up and talking to someone that might not be inside your comfort zone or inside your cultural circle, or going out and setting up a project that people can connect over even if they can't understand each other all the time, those are things that I keep coming back to. Those are things that I will never forget. Now, as a kid, I sometimes felt alienated by school because I felt that I should be learning the things that I wanted to learn, that I was passionate about, and not the things that were handed down to me. So I was always the kid that had to ask why. I was always the kid that was like, well, isn't paper actually three-dimensional, not two-dimensional? If you look at it, it's, it has some thickness to it and got me into trouble sometimes. So I, it was amazing when I finally found a place where I thought, where that part of me was honored. And that place was the Stone Soup Community Center. Now, Stone Soup Community Center was a uniquely positioned as a hub for projects of resistance and imagination of all kinds. Anyone could drop in and find out about what actions or meetings were happening that week, what petitions to sign, how to get involved. 
And it was also a place where everyone was welcomed and respected, where kids from the community could ju have just as much say in how it was run, sorry, as an experienced organizer. So it didn't feel like just because I was a youth, they were looking down on me or, because, or my opinions were devalued, but that I had an equal seat at the table. I remember <laughs> one of my first times walking into Stone Soup and they were making some kind of decision about how, who had power and what the responsibilities of the board were and what the responsibilities of the members were. And they were like, what do you think? What do I think? I'm 12 years old. I don't know, I don't know what I think. But no one had ever asked me that before. No one at school had ever asked, hey, how, do you, how much power do you think the teachers should have? What do you think that we should learn in class today? And it's that simple act of reaching past what you think someone is capable of to realize what their real potential is. Their real potential is to contribute something to the conversation. And it's not just nice, it's not just charity, it's necessary that those voices, the voices of youth in determining how our communities have run is absolutely essential to building an inclusive environmental movement. So Stone Soup has a very special place in my heart. In March 2009, we had an electrical fire and completely devastated it. And it's been a long battle to reopen the building. And in that time, we've incorporated as a nonprofit, uh, bought the building in its name, and ran a capital campaign. And the rebuild included a large expansion, increased disability access, and a green energy retrofit to make it more energy efficient. And as someone who started as a youth running around Stone Soup, getting, tripping up people that were trying to get work done in that space, to now being a board member of the Stone Soup Community Center, it's my great honor to announce that we'll be reopening this December. Yeah. After four years. So it was right after the Stone Soup fire and I was yearning for that feeling I'd had when I first walked into Stone Soup of being part of something bigger than myself, being part of something that was making a difference. And I also needed a job and I didn't just want to work in McDonald's. I didn't just want to work somewhere where people told me what to do and I spent my whole time working for money that went outside the community to poison people and not benefit my environment. So when I found Toxic Soil Busters, I was just beginning to define my own complicated political identity and feel out what like unfamiliar terms like social justice meant to someone like me growing up in Worcester. And what I quickly learned was two things. One was that it takes a whole lot of really long, boring meetings sometimes to get anything done. <laughs> and second, that there was a need, an urgent need, a desperate need for spaces where youth could exercise real control over their lives. I realized that everywhere youth aspirations were being co-opted by adult agendas that were already there, and it filled me with anger that I've tried to channel into these projects. I've begun to work with amazing adult allies who understand that you have to listen first before you can speak. And so even here, speaking, I feel uncomfortable because what I really want to do is listen to all the stories you have, so I hope you'll give me a chance to do that once I get down. <laughs> Youth especially are too often passed over or thought of only as the recipient of service, the recipients of charity, instead of their own agents of change. And youth are often spoken of as a resource to be mined or a vote to be cornered, but rarely as equal partners, someone that you connect with as an equal human being to embark on an endeavor and might have something important to say. Youth voices in the media are often confined to the spectrum of acceptable debate, what is considered appropriate for youth to have opinions about. Having youth presence in the environmental movement is not just an issue of inclusion, it is an issue of survival. Youth are on the front lines of environmental destruction, the most susceptible to environmental toxins and pollution, the first to be displaced by freak storms caused by climate change. True youth empowerment, for me, is inherently radical and counter to entrenched power structures who it benefits that youth aren't aware of the issues that are in their community. And we don't need not just youth voices, we need not just youth speaking, but youth power. Not just the privilege to plead for our planet, but the tools and skills to strike back against those that would destroy it. <laughs> Toxic Soil Busters is a project that really inspires me because I feel it takes the next step from empowering youth to talk about the issues in the community to actually doing something about it. And that means running their own youth-led cooperative business, even when people say, well, youth can't run their own business, and proving them wrong. 
It means doing lead soil testing, lead safe remediation, working with community to give back, to not just be people that the community serves, but also people that can serve the community. Doing soil sa safety education and lead safe landscaping. This is a map of the instances of childhood lead poisoning in Massachusetts, and we see big clusters down here near New Bedford and in Worcester in the post-industrial areas. And here is a map of Worcester, that's Maine South, the cluster of red dots right there. Those are the neighborhoods, the people of color, low-income communities that are disproportionately affected by those poisons. And that, when I see that map, I'm reminded of why we do the work we do, because these environmental injustices affect people differently based on these false barriers, and that's what we need to stop. Toxic soil busters. Toxic Soil Busters was modeled off of a worker cooperative model, so that means a business owned and operated by a membership where every member has equal say. And our dedication to promoting these networks of worker cooperatives comes from this, this realization that the vast majority of big, big, businesses, big businesses owned by a few people can never put the environment or their workers before profits for long, and that cooperatives can create these democratic workplaces, jobs that stay in the community and live out the needs and wants of that community. The administration site. Us getting down and dirty and doing the work that needs to be done. So cooperatives. Now this fall, Worcester Roots in collaboration with the Cooperative Development Institute, Boston Center for Community Ownership, is holding our very first co-op academy, which is this comprehensive co-op training program which gives prospective member owners the knowledge, resources, tools, and connections, the interpersonal uh, relationships that they need to start their own business and become part of a national cooperative movement which is taking the traditional economy by storm. 20 sessions over 10 weeks include these in-depth, personalized, and participatory trainings on incorporation, finance, market analysis, group development, all those long meetings you were just talking about that it takes to make these amazing projects happen. And we support these community-minded entrepreneurs in discovering themselves as creative agents in a new, compassionate economy. And these are just some of the cooperatives that have chosen to join us, showing an array from everywhere from youth media co-ops to landscaping co-ops to pedicab to biodiesel bus services. Now, one last thing I want to leave you with. Um, this November, we're holding a conference in Worcester, Massachusetts called the Solidarity and Green Economy Conference. So if any of the things that I've said so far interest you or you think that a economy based upon compassion, based on mutual aid, based on caring about each other, isn't just nice, isn't just something that we want to have, but something that we need to have. Something that if we're gonna survive the next 100 years, we need to build these relationships between each other and not rely on corporations that have the power, not rely on governments, not rely on top-down systems to solve our problems for us. Then I'd like you to join me November 9th and 10th, and we're gonna be talking about some of the solutions that people have come up with just like here in Connecting for Change, to battle these issues. Well, that's what it's about. This is why Connecting for Change inspires me so much. How many people here are 18 or under? That's a significant number. That's more than you'll see of almost any other conference this size. And that's really what inspires me, bringing together young people, bringing together activists, bringing together organizers, educators, community leaders, nonprofits, anyone else who thinks that it's possible to have more equitable and fair, sustainable ways of organizing our communities and economies. That's what inspires me. So really, this isn't me trying to inspire you. I'm just one person. It's this whole room that really makes me realize that this is possible and that this is work that needs to be done. You know, at first glance, Worcester is just another decaying, you know, mid-sized city without any industry or infrastructure. But just beneath that surface, if you manage to tap into that vein, if you manage to go past the veneer, the, the facade, the things that people tell you about a city, to actually find out about what's going on here, that's something that we need to do as communities every time we encounter a group that we say, oh, this is, 
that's what's going on. I already know what's happening with this group. Oh, I already know what's happening with youth. They're apathetic. They don't know what's going on. They don't care. They don't have skills. They can't communicate. They can't organize anything. Saying no, 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 no. That's not the narrative that we want to put out there. We want to put out a narrative that we can do this and that we can change our communities if we put our minds to it and if we aren't put into a box by systems that would have us shut up. So it's about finding that interconnected community of people working cooperatively and in solidarity, you know, in unity with one another, striving to find these new ways of living. And we can, when we can collaborate between each other, these nonprofits and city governments, small businesses and activists, it reminds me that it's not just the visions that we build together that are important, but the connections that we build between each other. The relationships are what are going to last. For, take Stone Soup, the community center, for example. Stone Soup has Worcester Roots Project. These are all organizations that rent space in this one community center. Worcester Roots Project, Toxic Soil Busters, a community bike shop, an ex-prisoner and prisoner rights group, Central Mass, ACLU, a homeless youth outreach center, a computer lab, a multi-generational video co-op, an anti-war group that cooks free community meals, a radical library, and a graphic shop. All these in one place. What does that make? When those barriers between the work that we do are broken down, when these artificial ways of thinking about things in boxes, and you're doing your work and I'm doing mine, get completely blown apart and we can see that true, powerful cross-pollination where new ideas that were never thought to be possible can now spring up. Here in Worcester, we're not just creating institutions, we're creating a culture a culture of inclusion, a culture of empowerment, a culture of sustainability, a culture that doesn't value corporations over people or their budgets over our health and safety, a culture of change and solidarity we can all own, that we can all be a part of, and that we can all believe in. And here in Worcester, we're not waiting to be told that it's possible. We're not waiting for the government to do it for us. We're recentering workers, youth, people of color, the evicted and foreclosed on, the unemployed and disenfranchised in a movement to take back our economy, take back our city, and take back our future. Thank you very much.